another edition of the public interest i am Malika ramsey thank you very much for joining us and of course as always with me is leader of the people's national congress reform and leader of the opposition mr david granger welcome sir thank you Malika. on today's program we focus on the quality of life in guyana as you know the quality of life in guyana continues to deteriorate and a partnership for national unity especially uh, the leader mr david granger has continuously expressed concern about this deterioration so today we'll be talking about uh, exactly what it is he believes that's causing that uh, deterioration and how we can possibly fix it first of all uh, mr granger i'm going to go back a bit even though it's the beginning of the program um the undp uh, human development index report in 2004 had indicated that guyana is ranked uh, 177 um, regarding human development and regarding the quality of life the first question basically is how did we get there? I mean, I know the results now are going to be a bit different because that was 2004, as I said. But how did we get there and are we even worse off than then? Well, Malika, um, I remember the, the conditions in, under which we lived a decade ago. And quite frankly, things haven't changed much. We have moved up a bit um, on the index. But when you look at the newspapers, and I think... Every right-thinking Guyanese would have been shocked to look at the Kaichua news earlier this week and see our school children, our Amarillian school children at the village of uh, Keto, which as you know is in the Potaro Sipuruni region, Region 8, fetching logs. And that story, that picture told a story of the quality of life in Guyana. Young children at secondary school People we should be looking forward to training as scientists, as mathematicians, as engineers, fetching logs. This looked like a, a photograph from the Middle Ages. And I think that picture was really worth 10,000 words. How did we get there? We got there because we have an uncaring government. The government thinks it can put up a stadium, it can build a bridge, it can, you know, uh, promise uh, lights and you know, improve the highways. These things are all important, but they're not sufficient to provide a good life. In February, March this year, for example, you recall that in the Burima Waini region, region one, we had a situation in which three children are known to have died, and over 500 children. I mean, I'm not talking, this is not an exaggeration, this is from the government news agency. Over 500 children fell ill out of gastroenteritis. And when you look at the photograph of the, of the river, of the Kaichuma River, Port Kaichuma, and when you consider the massive hospitalization um, of young people, particularly children, uh, because children are very vulnerable to gastroenteritis, uh, and for some of them it was fatal, you'd see why we are ranked so low on the Human Development Index. When we speak of quality of life, when we speak of um, the good life and a partnership for national unity from day one has promised the guy and his people a good life and we'll get the opportunity to develop, to deliver that good life to them. When we speak of good life, you're speaking about health, you're speaking about education, you're speaking about culture, you're speaking about leisure, access to sport. Um, you're speaking about a safe and clean environment. You're speaking about um, security from, from crime. And um, all of these things make the good life. And when you see the UNDP, which is an impartial body, an international organization, ranking Guyana so low, you have to accept that the conditions of life in Guyana are indeed very poor, and particularly particularly in comparison with our neighbors, Suriname, Venezuela, and Brazil, and in comparison with the Caribbean, because we got independence in 1966, um, the same year as Barbados, and Barbados is probably 40 places or 50 places or more ahead of Guyana. And uh, when you go to those countries, you realize immediately that there's a difference in quality of life. The, up, the low level of crime, the more efficient solid waste disposal, all of these factors um, help to push us down. 
and we will not overcome the, the ranking simply by manipulating a few statistics. We have to get the health of the country, education, the crime, we have to bring all those factors in con under control. All right, sir. I'll come back to the statistics in a while. Um, I don't want to make this discussion about it, but you mentioned earlier in your comments the children, uh, the photograph that we've all seen by now uh, with the children fetching the logs, especially in their uniforms. I have heard statements since that photograph, uh, photograph was released that, look, in our day when we were young children, we had to do stuff like that in terms of helping our parents at home. I am not trying to be, uh, to be annoying <laughs> regarding this issue, but your thoughts on that, that look, children should understand that they must do these little chores, not necessarily in uniform, but your, your thoughts, sir? Well, I think we've all gone to secondary school, or most of us have gone to secondary school, and we've never had to sacrifice um, our education school hours to do that sort of work, even if we help at home. Mm -hmm. Because uh, certainly in many years, we know that people still use uh, kerosene or they still use wooden uh, fireplaces or stoves. And um, that is a chore which could be done in uh, maybe a few minutes or a very short time of the day. It wouldn't involve sacrificing your lessons or you know, school time, valuable school time. That is something you can do maybe over, during the holidays or maybe your dad or somebody could do that. But I have never had to undergo that. And I don't think it is something that we should regard as normal that school children should <laughs> have to fetch wood when they go to school. They should be learning mathematics and science. And, um, and look at those logs. Those were not twigs and matchsticks. Those are some the serious heavy lifting they were doing there. That is work. And I think everybody accepts it's wrong. The minister accepts it's wrong. They promised to conduct an investigation. And it mustn't happen again. Children go to school to learn. Let them work at home if they have logs to fetch. And I don't think, I, I've been in the hinterland. And I've never seen Amerindian children of that age carrying logs of that size any time. APNU continues to, not only APNU, society in general continues to complain about uh, the fact that the quality of life in Guyana is not up to standard or it's not uh, the way it should be. Now, Governments can argue that, look, we have programs like the uniform vouchers, school feeding programs, the WOW and the youth training programs. My question really is, sir, were these programs not designed to improve the quality of life? And obviously they're not necessarily doing that. Why, is, why are these programs not aiding with the development of quality of life in Guyana? In economics, there's the, um, the notion of something being necessary but not sufficient. Yes, um, everyone knows that the indigenous population, uh, which you know is largely confined to the hinterland and certain other riverine areas, um, live on the disadvantageous conditions. You know, I know, I've seen it myself, children still paddle canoe sometimes an hour to get to school. Uh, sometimes the the schools are understaffed or under-equipped um, because they're so remote. Um, they do not get the best quality teachers. Um, they don't have proper textbooks. The laboratories are not equipped. So it is useful, it is good that they should have um, maybe resources. They should be provided with resources uh, that you mentioned. You know, school uniforms, you know, school meals. Um, but it is not enough. It is not enough, it's not sufficient. It is necessary, but not sufficient. More must be done, because those children operate in very disadvantageous conditions. I don't think you've ever had to paddle a canoe for one hour to go to school, for example. But that is normal. I'm not saying that um, we can uh, provide the type of relief in every single case, but uh, more must be done. You talked about statistics earlier. The public continues to hear things like uh, the per capita income and, and, and they, they use that to refer to the quality of life in Guyana, especially coming from the finance minister and government. Most people don't necessarily, the average person, would not necessarily understand all those figures. What they know is that, look, at the end of the month, I can't 
afford or I have to struggle to put food on the table, how do we again solve these problems? Well, using certain statistics could be misleading. There's an old saying, you know, that um, they have lies, damn lies, and statistics, which means statistics is the worst form of lying. Um, when we speak of per capita income, and sometimes people use other expressions like the purchasing power of your income um, in order to make comparisons because, you know, sometimes you may say, well, the per capita income may be $3,000, but it doesn't mean that everybody in the country gets $3,000. Um, it could mean that um, maybe one person is getting maybe $6,000 per other person getting not, so the average is, is $3,000. Um, and this is what um, happens when you read statistics incorrectly. And yes, you may argue, some people have argued that the actual gross domestic product of the country has increased. It is possible. I don't know the truth. Sometimes the statistics could be misleading. Similarly, the per capita income has increased. But the, the disparity between the very rich and the very poor has also widened. The gap has also widened. So you have some very rich people, and you have a lot more poor people. But statistically, the average seems to be um, you know, very comfortable, but it is misleading. So um, I would say, use your eyeballs, use your common sense. Go and walk through Georgetown, and you see the amount of homeless, school, the destitute people, the school dropouts, the beggars, you know. You see the garbage, you see you know, people sleeping on the street, and you know something is going wrong. I mean, the, the, your eyeballs, the, what you see there on the streets are not mistakes. They're not you know, somebody trying to put on a, a show. These are the real conditions on which people live. Go in Sophia, look at the roads, look at where people are living. Go in some of the villages, and you see what is taking place. Read the papers. Look at the, the insecurity of life, you know, on the quarantine uh, a couple of days ago, some husband strangled his wife. People are insecure, people feel threatened, children are dropping out of school. So when we speak about statistics, we have to look not only at the numerical figures, but you also have to look at quality of life. And that is why we, in a partnership for national unity, are paying so much attention to quality. Because looking at the numbers, you would get um, maybe an inaccurate picture. And if you start to measure quality, are people happy? You know, um, when a, a youngster comes out of school, could he or she get a job? Would that job, job pay um, a reasonable salary to allow him or her to uh, continue, um, maybe pursue advanced studies? to buy a home, get a car, to live comfortably. That's what we're talking about, comfort, happiness, you know. If wives are afraid of husbands, if you send your child to buy, um, you, know, uh, you know, a loaf of bread, you screech, you know, your child gets knocked down, child living in Bagatstown or something, where they're always racing through. You know, life becomes very uncertain. And what we see happening in Guyana, is an increase in interpersonal violence. In the hinterland, two people drinking, three people drinking, they get into an argument, somebody pulls out an ice pick and stabs them to death. You know, at a wedding, some drunken person, and sometimes it's a friend. These are not strangers. These are not foreigners invading the country. These are people you know. But the level of interpersonal violence indicates that in society, we seem to be uh, more hostile to each other. All of these indicate a lowering of the quality of life. Look at how people dress. You know, um, there's so many people in rags and tatters. Sometimes you, you see children in the hinterland going to school. Some almost barefooted, some wear the um, rubber slippers. Some are worst, you know. And um, they don't get proper meals. In the hinterland, coming back to the original picture you saw in the newspaper earlier this week, there are over 2,500 children in dormitories alone. In addition to that, many children, because of the distance of their homes from the schools, 
have to get um, meals at, at lunch time. And sometimes they just get um, cassava bread or peanut butter or something. But it's not nutritionally sufficient for them. So all of these are factors which contribute to the lowering of, of the quality of life. And as I said, um, you know, some of the interventions that the government has made are, are um, I suppose, commendable. But a lot more must be done in order to make life more happy for, for our younger generation particularly. We're going to come back to government's intervention a bit uh, in a minute. Before I do that, if this um, downward spiral regarding the quality of life continues, maybe uh, in the, let's say, in the next decade, where do you see Guyana? Well, it is not a, a rule that every society should improve. We could get worse. Um, and there are countries in around the world, not many, in which um, the living conditions have deteriorated and sometimes they've degenerated into civil conflict because um, the very poor um, feel that they're being oppressed and they take up weapons and attack the people who they feel are oppressing them. And right now in the world, several conflicts are raging, sometimes based on ethnicity, sometimes based on religion, sometimes based on economic deprivation. So I don't want to go there, hmm. but um, things can get worse and it can lead to, to social conflict. If you look around the world, um, let us look at the Middle East, for example. What is called the Middle East? Um, the Maghreb, that is that northern strip of North Africa, where, which is largely Islamic, running from Morocco to Egypt, and look at what is happening in Syria, Iraq, all the way to Central Asia, to Afghanistan. There are many conflicts raging at this moment. And some of the conflicts arise out of discrimination, out of religious um, intolerance, and out of um, the fact that some people are dissatisfied with the quality of life. So, um, I don't want to go there as I said, but um, things can get worse. And if things got worse, uh, persons who suffer may feel that they have no option but to resort to violent remedies to get out of the plight. The government of Guyana's role, is it that government don't know how to solve uh, this problem or is it that they just, they're just they just not willing, they lack the willpower? Well, the, governments, um, the, the government that we have is, uh, the executive is made up largely, well, exclusively by the People's Progressive Party, even though on the 28th of November 2011, the Alliance for Change and the Partnership for National Unity together got a majority of, of the voters, 175,000 roughly, as against the 166,000 by the PPP. The PPP still be, believes it is, uh, it is um, obliged or it has the right or it's entitled to run the country on its own. No, it does not pay attention to what the opposition has been calling for. And I, it is my view that they run the country in the interest of a few. Um, they run the country on a partisan basis in the interest of the PPP and a handful of their supporters. All the fat contracts go to their supporters. And that is why APNU has um, had to take a stand against certain big projects, and they're making a mess of the big projects. Look at what is happening at the Skeldon factory. Uh, they've packed the board with a lot of the PPP cronies, and as a result of that, the industry is poorly managed. Um, they want to build, um, to extend the Chedi Jagan International Airport, um, Amaila Falls, the Maya Hotel, but these um, projects have not been discussed with us. So they have been playing with their cards very close to the chest, particularly under the regime of Bar Jagdil. And I would say that they don't care because they have a mindset. The PPP has a mindset. They feel that they must dominate every single board, every committee, every commission. That is, a, that is what led to the conflict, um, 
the, or the controversy about the appointment of the chancellor. Uh, this matter came up eight years ago, 2005, when Madame Desri Bernard was the Chancellor. And under the Constitution, the President is obliged to consult with the leader of the opposition. Now, there has been gridlock for eight years. I proposed a way forward to end the gridlock. And they just want me to go there, according to Dr. Luncheon, and say yes or no. I must approve their nominee. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, let us give the Guyanese people a person that they feel satisfied with. Let us show them a transparent process. Let us interview all of the qualified people who are interested in the post. And let us make a selection. And then the Guyanese people can say, yes, the process was clear and transparent. I understood what happened. And I'm happy with the outcome. So what we have in Guyana is a party that has been dominating this country for the last 20 years. But it's very philosophy, it's very mindset, it's mentality, it's outlook on life is one of domination, continued domination. So uh, you don't have to be some international spy to find out what's happening at Keto or Paramakatoi or, or, or Anai Secondary Schools. You can visit these places and see how children live. You can walk through the streets of Georgetown. You don't think the government knows what is happening in Georgetown with solid waste? You don't think they know about the homelessness? They've just built a home in Anvawakt in, in West Coast of Beast, in Region 5. They've built a home for, for um, destitute people. So they know there's a problem. But they're putting plasters on the sores. Instead of solving the poverty, the poverty problem, they're going to build a home and push all the poor people in the home. The whole idea is to provide employment for people. The whole idea is to provide a high quality of education so people don't need to drop out of school. People don't need to go into poor houses. You know, people have a better quality of life. But this government feels that they're spending too much money on people they don't care about, and there'll be less left for them. So I think that is the problem we have. It's a, it's a, it's a philosophical problem. In the partnership for national unity, we put people first. Every single measure we advance in the National Assembly is about people, young people, it's about jobs, it's about employment. Look at the Burima Waini. We were the ones who brought this matter, who were bringing this matter to the, to the public attention, to the National Assembly. How these young children died, how these children died, how these 500 people got ill. We called for investigation into the deaths of people between 2000 and 2010. How, the, how you arrive at all these bodies was an investigation done. And they keep trying to block APNU. Because they're not interested in, in looking after the welfare of the ordinary people. They're interested in looking after the welfare of the People's Progressive Party. In saying that you do put people first, sir, um, APNU and David Granger, what would be your first step to improve the quality of life again? And I'm asking this too because I know uh, APNU has always said that government continues to build, build uh, bu buildings and boast about these new and state-of-the-art buildings. but you need to look at people. What would be your uh, an APNU government's first move to improve the quality of life in Guyana? We've got to tackle poverty. We see here in Guyana what I call hereditary poverty because there's such a large mass of poor people who cannot provide for their children, who cannot even get transport for their children to go to school, who cannot even buy school snacks, who cannot um, uh, buy books and, and um, uniforms. Although some people get some assistance, many people do not get the assistance. We have to start paying our public servants better. We have to start ensuring that people around the country get a better, uh, get a living wage. And this can be done by employment. We have to provide more job opportunities, but we have to deal with the poverty problem, not by shelling out money, but by putting an education system in place where people can graduate, from which people can graduate and get well, good paying jobs. And once the poverty problem is solved, we move on to the education problem, and the education problem will solve the employment problem. So the, these three must be taken together. But poverty is a big problem in Guyana for a lot of families. Is it at all possible for the quality of life in Guyana to be improved under the current government? Well, 
this is the task, or this is partly the task of the of the National Assembly to keep pressure on the government um, to improve the quality of life. For example, uh, a partnership for national unity, concerned about the uh, conditions on which our senior citizens live, our pensioners, you know, moved since last year. We were able to bring about a change in the old age pension up to ten thousand dollars a month. And this year, we've been able to maintain that pressure. I think the government was you know, quite aware of what we intended to do, and they jumped ahead and increased it to $12,500. So we are concerned about quality of life because it is the pensioners who need more money because they need more medication, they need more care. And caring for a pensioner is more expensive than maybe caring for a teenager like yourself. Um, so that is one way, um, and I feel that uh, we will continue to use our strength, limited as it is in the National Assembly, to keep pressuring, pressing the government to improve the quality of life. That's what the National Assembly is doing. We will continue pressing for improvements in the education system. We are not going to put up with that nonsense you saw at Cato. Um, we are going to make sure this matter is thoroughly discussed, not in the press alone, but in the National Assembly. And we are going to keep pressing, as you know, APNU has uh, declared um, 2013 a year for youth. We're going to keep pressing for youth employment. We will go, we've started already through the Ghana Youth and Student Movement. We've started holding a series of seminars. It's almost mid-year. We have to go to some other areas like Region uh, 3, Region 4, Region uh, 10. We'll be going to those regions and take, we'll take the message of youth employment up there. Finally, on this broadcast, I'm at the risk of probably getting a, a, a repetitive response. It always comes back to the people, the ordinary people, and consultations. Apart from your work in the National Assembly that you plan to continue, is there any indication that maybe APNU will uh, put proposals to the PPP, to government, as it relates to improving the quality of life in Guyana? Well, our focus has always been quality of life, and in the middle of the budget debate in April, this is exactly what we attempted to do. Um, Mr. Kamara Dramjatan of the Alliance for Change and myself, we signed a letter to the President, Mr. Donald Ramatar. We did have a meeting, we had two meetings, and at the top of the list of points that we wanted to discuss was the question of um, improvement in wages for, um, for public servants and across the board increase it. They didn't agree to anything. Um, that is why when I went to Mr. Ramatar again, I didn't carry a shopping list. I said, uh, Mr. Ramatar, we've got to change the way we run this country. I don't see any point in coming to you with a shopping list uh, and you saying no. But uh, we need to understand that unless um, people are treated better in this country, we'll never develop. So um, we are now working on improving the governance and we will continue to work in the National Assembly. If um, the PPP doesn't want to look at our list of matters, of, of, um, of items for improving, you know, they, they'll have to deal with certain governance issues and we will insist that new legislation uh, is designed in such a way to prevent the government from dominating them. And that is one of the ways in which you get the type of governance that uh, will bring about um, high quality of life in Guyana. So the National Assembly is key to bringing about change for the poor people of this country. Key. Thank you very much, sir. Leader of the People's National Congress Reform and Leader of the Opposition, Mr. David Granger. This has been another edition of The Public Interest. I am Malika Ramsey. Thanks for watching. <laughs>